Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Welcome to the Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our show today, pension reform adversely impacts the Taiwan military. And joining us via Skype from Kaohsiung in southern Taiwan is retired Republic of China Navy uh, Admiral uh, Lawrence Dan. Uh, he had a very distinguished naval career. Uh, he um, served uh, as the defense head of the defense attache office of the Taiwan Embassy in Washington. He additionally uh, had a long career in anti-submarine warfare, which also included uh, mine warfare. And um, he, uh, as uh, in his retired life, he's certainly keeping busy as he's studying for a PhD degree at Sun Yat-sen University in Kaohsiung, on, uh, focused on U.S.-China relations. Previous to that, he got a master's degree at the U.S. Naval Postgraduate School. Uh, so we're very fortunate to have him with us, and uh, welcome to Asian Review. It's great to have you. Yeah, that, it's my pleasure to be here. That's great. That's great. Well, let's get right into it. Um, pension reform. Of course, Tsai Ing-wen realizes that the pension system in Taiwan, if, she, if something's not done, it's going to go broke. But her reforms have really stirred up a lot of political animosity, especially in the military. And uh, there have been so big demonstrations in Taipei. Um, I, I believe there was one army colonel was actually killed in one of the demonstrations. So what's going on? Well, actually, talk about the pension reform. The veterans, they never again the pension reform because it is really a, a, a financial crisis yeah, that I just mentioned. However, what caused the crisis? Because the, why is the, uh, the pension reform is not happening in any country, but in the U.S., the, there is a pension reform, but it only can get better and better. But now the pension reform in Taiwan is going to cut your pension. So if we go back to the 1950s, there were over 700,000 military, and now there's only less than 200,000. So there are a, lot, a big number cut in the military. But during the cutting process, the government didn't prepare any major to mend the vacancies, otherwise you're going to pay for the pension of the veterans. So it, this is, uh, uh, the, the government didn't do their job. So why did the veterans fail? Why should we punish? Because it's the government's fault. We didn't do any fault. However, the veterans, they understand that it's going to pangra. So say the truth. Uh, they support the reform, but they uh, uh, they oppose the way how the DPP government put forward uh, put forward the, the pension reform. That that is a real problem because. Um, well, let, let's stop right there. How how did what what was the problem with the way that the DPP government put forward the the pension reform? Well, you know, there's a lot of reform, in not only for the pension for the military, but also the reform for the labor and um, and for the government worker, the, the government employee. But the government tried to divide the labor, and the more than 100, uh, more than 10 million labor, that means more than 10 million votes, which uh, traditionally support the DPP government. And the military and the government workers, there are only 870,000, and most of them support the, the KMT. So, uh, well, that's not exact the number, but that, uh, this is just a, uh, this is a regular phenomenon in Taiwan. So this, that reform put a lot of political con contact in the process. And why is it the veterans so opposed to the reform? Because uh, the DPP government, they take the wrong step at the very beginning. So you call it a, a financial crisis. So this is a financial issue. But the DPP operated to the social issue. Uh, there is a, there is a, a pension reform committee, and most member of that committee is social worker or active social activist. And the leader is actually a, a professor of a social work. So they're more focused on the social justice. So they, what they're doing is the justice amount of generation and the justice of distribution. That caused the pension reform actually become a pension 
redistribution. Let, so let, me, let, me, doing, let, uh, let me jump in here because there's a couple of things I think we need to clarify because this is a very confusing yeah. issue. And some of our, our listeners might not be all that familiar with it. Um, did I understand you right that Tsai Ing-wen is using this pension reform to help the, the, the workers, the blue-collar workers of Taiwan, and sort of discriminating against the military? Did I understand that right? Well, I'm not saying she intentionally to do that, but that there are a lot of political contact in this kind of action uh, when when she put put for the, the reform. Uh, can I just mention that because the, the first way going to have the bankruptcy problem is the labor insurance mm -hmm. that will happen in the next ten years, mm -hmm. and the pension for the military and the government employee that will happen in fifteen years from now. Mm -hmm. So the labor reform it has to be the first priority, but the government is, is doing the uh, pension reform on the military and the, and the government employee. So uh, it, it, it comes as kind of a weird feeling for for all of them. That, and everybody believes that most of the labor they are more supportive to the DPP and most of the military that support the uh, the blue. Wow. So it actually, so uh, it is a, there is political ramifications. There are, there are political uh, ramifications. Uh, 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 I still have to clarify the pension reform. We have to do it because phase two is going to bankrupt. But however, there are a lot of political cont cont contact in it that made the veteran feel very uncomfortable. You know, this is really very interesting because my understanding has been that. Tsai Ing-wen, when she took office, she, the first month, few months she was in office, she visited all, so many military bases in Taiwan. She visited the, the Army Academy, the Military Academy in Fengshan, Kaohsiung, your hometown, uh, made a very big presence there, really wants to boost up the national defense industry says she's going to increase the national defense budget to 3 percent of GDP, something the U.S. has been after for a long time. Right. And my impression was that she was reasonably popular with the military. But now what I'm hearing from you is <laughs> maybe she's not. <laughs> now, you know, what Chai Ing-wen is doing now is exactly what the president of the Republic of China should do. But what he had done when he was a candidate, when he was a chairman of the DPP, is totally different. Mm. You know, when, when, he was, uh, when he was running for the president of the campaign, the DPP, they, they just tolerate her party member to, to humiliate the military. Uh. You know, just, just, yeah, there's just two, uh, very, uh, two examples. Uh, you probably know uh, one Apache pilot. He's so proud of his job, and he invited his personal friend to visit the Apache helicopter. Ah, uh, I remember and, that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and those people took photo on a helicopter. So unfortunately, those personal, uh, those private friends are a celebrity and rich people, and one of them is even a movie star. So DPP very successfully uh, to foster an uh, atmosphere of relative deprivation among ordinary people, and they, they, they argue why those people have the privilege, they have a special right to visit the Apache, but we don't. So that become a turmoil in the society that lasts for months. And finally, that pilot was, was, uh, was trial for the martial court. And the, the other example would be uh, the one soldier who died of his stroke uh, during a correction training. Uh, yes. and, uh, Corp yeah, Corporal Hong, Hong, right? Yeah, yeah. And Tsai Ing-wen led the demonstration against the minister. And, no, and, and, and as a result, the, the defense minister stepped down and all the court martial were lifted from the military. And since then, all the military crime would go to the civil court. So that really hurt, you know, the cut damage to uh, the military, and that even become a a habitual action to humiliate the military. Even after Taiwan became the president, there one the one example that only three weeks after she became the president, and one woman who pro independence is so exciting, he openly 
to shout at an old veteran says, you are the Chinese refugee, you get out of Taiwan, we don't want you to be here. And she took video and, and uploaded it to the internet. This, is, this so, is a really important point that you're hitting on here, I think, because um, it's obvious, I think, that from, for, to anyone that observes Taiwan military affairs, political affairs, there's still tension between the military and the population. And I think it's fair to say, in the past, in the days of martial law, the military did a few things that probably shouldn't have done. Yeah. And people remember the Taiwan Garrison Command, but that's in the past. But a lot of people don't forget that kind of thing. It's very easy, and it makes it very difficult for today's military. Yeah, yeah that's really the good, because that, that really a bad bad impression to the military in the past. But after Jiang Jingguo became the president, he tried to nationalize the military. Because it, in, in Chinese, uh, uh, ROC on board mean, uh, in Chinese called Guo Jun. Mm -hmm. Guo Jun to actually have two meanings. One is a nationalist army, and the other is a national army. Right. So you, when you think about the nationalist army, it was built by Chiang Kai-shek or the KMT. The, actually, it was the KMT army. Right. So the civil war, it China civil war actually is a war between the nationalist and the communists. So after Jiang Jingguo became the president, he wanted to nationalize the nationalist army by uh, by stop all KMT activity in the military. So since Jiang Jingguo, the military already nationalized. So when you talk about the, the, the martial law, that, that really in the past. But after right. Jiang Jingguo and the president, he did a lot of effort to make the Aussie Armed Force a real national force instead of the nationalist forces. So that, but however, that bad image is still there in the older generation. Right. But the younger nation, they were taught by the old generation about the bad history. So this just kind of a, a that kind of a, a bad image existed. That that true. Uh, so the military really want to make the image better. However, the, the DPP they want to get the power. So during the campaign, they, the, uh, the military became a very cheap target. Yeah. So they, they take the, the past and humiliate the military, try to get support from the general public. And that helped DPP to, to win the power. Uh, well, this is a part of reason, a major reason for DPP that they, they became the ruling party right now. You know, this is really, from the perspective of the U.S. government, of course, I'm not an official of the U.S. government, but I certainly talk to a lot of U.S. government officials. and. Um, and, of course, they're worried about the conscription system in Taiwan. They're worried about the reserve system. And because of this sort of leftover bad feeling, it really hurts the conscription system. Or I, I shouldn't say conscription. I should say the volunteer system, because Taiwan is really challenged to get an adequate number of volunteers. And I, I think it also impacts the reserve system, which uh, a lot of people um, I think in Taiwan and in Washington are not too happy with. Yeah, and well, actually, you, you talk about all our volunteer for it. It also very have a uh, clear relation relation with um, with the military in it. Right. You know, just, you just mentioned after Taiwan became the president, he really do very hard how to mend the relationship that already damaged during the presidential campaign. Right. So whenever he go to the uh, military post, he always remind everyone that I am the commander in chief. I will take care of you. You can count on me. I am your backing. I will share the honor and shame with all of you. Well, it's all very nice work, but I'm not active duty right now. I'm not at a thing. I don't know how those people, when they hear the speech from Taiwan, how, how much credit they will take. Mm -hmm. However, the damn is really there. So I've even Taiwan works so hard, but it's very hard to, to mend the relationship that damage in, in the past. So that's also a, a, a major reason So young people, they don't want to join the military. Right. Because the military have a relative, you know, the, the, the bad image in, 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 in the society compared with the other, other occupations. I, uh, that's my understanding, too. Um, well, let me ask you this. This might be kind of an interesting, uh, maybe a little sensitive point, but let's try this anyway. When you were going to the Naval Academy, um, you had to be a member of the Nationalist Party, correct? No, no, oh, after. Af afterwards. Yeah, uh, after, when, when, when I became an officer. When you became an officer. 
And in yeah. those days, um, I'm not exactly sure when you graduated, but I, I'm just going to sort of guess here. Um, when you graduated, you had to become a member of the Nationalist Party. And in those days, there was no DPP. And um, well, what do I want to say here? OK, so it was like the party controlled the military. The party's, the military's loyalty wasn't necessarily to the country, it was to the party. Is that correct? Well, actually, well, that was in the authoritarian era when the Kuomintang had only one party in Taiwan. Right. It's just very similar like the Communist Party right now. In, in, but after Taiwan— I, 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 was, I was getting there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. After Taiwan democracy, it's not a problem at all. Just, I just mentioned, uh, after Jiang Jingguo became the president, he stopped all the KMT activity in the military. So I remember the last time I attended the, the, K, uh, the KMT activity was when I was uh, a lieutenant or lieutenant junior grade that 35 years ago. So at least 35 years ago, there was no more KMT activity in the military. So yeah, and, I am the, I'm the example. In these days, yeah. these days, the military is loyal to the country, not to any party. No, not to any party, because the military already nationalized, and thanks to the effort of President Jiang Jingguo. Very interesting point. I think this is a good place for us to take a break. You're watching Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. My uh, guest today is uh, retired Taiwan uh, uh, Admiral Lawrence Dan. Uh, we're having a great discussion about pension reform in Taiwan, military pension reform, and how it impacts the military. We'll be right back. Don't go away. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. Every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m., I hope you'll join me for Likeable Science, where we'll dig into science, dig into the meat of science, dig into the joy and delight of science. We'll discover why science is indeed fun, why science is interesting, why people should care about science, and care about the research that's being done out there. It's all great, it's all entertaining, it's all educational, so I hope you'll join me for Likeable Science. Welcome back to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Uh, our show today uh, is uh, Pension Reform Adversely Affects the Taiwan Military. Uh, and my guest is a uh, retired Republic of China Admiral, uh, Larry Dan. Uh, he has a really very, he had a very, very distinguished career. Uh, he was uh, head of the Defense Attaché Office at the Republic of China Embassy in Washington. Uh, he also had a very extensive career in uh, undersea warfare, mine warfare, etc. And right now, um, in addition to a master's degree he got at the uh, Naval, U.S. Naval Postgraduate School, he's studying for a Ph.D. at Sun Yat-sen University. Uh, welcome back. Well, let's move on now to this um, question about Taiwan's will to fight. Now, whenever I go to PACOM, and PACOM occasionally invites me up there to give a lecture about one thing or the other, and the question always comes up, um, what's Taiwan's will to fight? What's Taiwan's will to fight? And there's some skepticism, I think, in PACOM, at least for the folks I talk to about this. What's your take? Actually, the, the, the will to fight is not a military issue, it's a political issue in Taiwan, because there no any country would, would question whether they are on for the have the will to fight. You know, in Taiwan, it, it's kind of issue, not because China is so strong and hard to be defeated, but uh, because that issue was raised a couple years ago when the DPP, some DPP member questioned whether the armed forces know what they are fighting for. 
Uh, that happened in 2011, and one three-star general or the four-star U.S. equivalent, he uh, invited a bit of China, and in a banquet, he said both Nationalist Army and the Communist Army are all Chinese Army. So, but he was correct. You still have to mention Nationalist Army is obviously also had two different meanings. The Nationalist Army that no longer exists. But when you talk about the Nationalist Army and Communist Army are both Chinese Army, the blue can attack him that you are talking about the National Army stand with the Communist together and play the partnership in the war. So that's really the question of whether you know what you're fighting for. You are Taiwanese and you stand with the Chinese and say you are both Chinese army. Okay, let so, me jump let me uh, jump in here because you're, you're you're hitting on something really interesting. In today's Taiwan military, what would the Taiwan military be fighting for? Well, that's that also the good question. When you talk about the where to fight and fight for what? Fight for defending Taiwan, for Taiwan security, or fight for Taiwan independence? So that is the question. Many, many pro-independent people, they will say that the answer don't have a where to fight or they don't know what to fight for. It's from the Taiwan independence perspective. Because you, you are the, you are Taiwanese and you you should fight with the Chinese. So this is very controversial. You know, this is a conflict between Taiwan. It's so so polarized, so divided. Uh, an example, like you know, flying tigers. Flying right, tigers right, right, right. So of the U.S. and the Republic of China fought together against Japan. Of World so, War II fame, uh, right? <laughs> as a flying tiger, designed by the Walt Disney. So. Uh, <laughs> The Air Force 401 wing, he is the successor of Flying Tiger. So on their six F-16, they're the Flying Tiger emblem on, on the, their F-16. So some people who pro independent they said, Flying Tiger has nothing to do with Taiwan. Why you put a Chinese symbol on your F-16? Mm. So as you see, the, uh, a lot of people, they doubt whether the armed forces of the Republic of China know what are you are fighting for because they are pro-independent. Well, so that well, let me let me just you know um, interject this. It seems to yeah. me that the folks in the Taiwan military it doesn't matter if it's Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard for that matter, they're all coming from Taiwan these days. They have less and less of a direct connection with China. Well, that's the history. They're not flying tiger. It's from, it's from the Republic of China when the Republic of China was in China. And it's a part of the, the history of the ROC armed forces. So they treasure, they respect the history of the, of the history. But the, the pro independent they want to get rid of every symbol concerning with China. So that is a problem. Mm. So the the ROC armed forces, they, the country they protect by the constitution is the Republic of China. Not Republic of Taiwan that not existed. So that becomes a gap of the equitation between those people pro independent and the national military. So that is the question. Uh, when you talk about the will to fight, actually, the, at, at a soldier, a soldier is a killing machine. You should follow orders. You want to kill, he kill. You want to go to danger place, he go. You want to, he, uh, you want to die, he die. He just follow orders. So. The will to fight is not an issue to the military. The question is how well he fights and how strong he is persevering in the battlefield. No, mm -hmm. so will to fight is not an issue. So the problem is the morale. The morale is that there are several elements that constitute the morale. Uh, whether the, yeah. No, no, that's a good question because uh, what we're talking about now very much leads into morale. And some people would say that the morale in the Taiwan military is pretty low. Well, it's, yeah, uh, the morale constitutes several elements. Uh, uh, the confidence, whether you are confident of your, you have a better equipment, whether you believe you have better training than the enemy, that you are confident to defeat your enemy, and whether you're supported and, and respected by the people. Whether there a uh, brotherhood among the soldiers and a mutual trust between the leadership and the soldiers. Mm. So all of those elements constitute the morale. But actually, that is the issue in Taiwan, because those elements is facing a very serious challenge. So that maybe that caused some people to think there's low morale in the military, because we, have, uh, we still use the off-fleet. Uh, equipment and with training is, is more, you know, it's like some people would argue that, that 
Now, the boot camp is like a summer camp. So they have mass yeah. and, and to humiliate the military. And now they cut the pension and didn't make the uh, military feel they are proud to be, be the military, they're exceptional with the others. So the, the, the pride of the military is, is damaged a lot because of a divided society in Taiwan. You know, you, earlier you were talking about those Apaches that Taiwan bought from the United States. And yeah, there was that um, flight officer that showed off the Apache and brought out his girlfriend and a movie star and all that. But you know, the way I saw that was they felt so proud to be getting such sophisticated aircraft. And I think the U.S. is the only other country that has that particular model of Apache. And, and as you just suggested, some of the equipment in the Taiwan military was somewhat vintage. And uh, when they got those Apaches, you know, first line, front line, um, um, I, I, I sense the swelling of pride. Yeah, it should be. You know, uh, I was a commander, I was a uh, CEO of a Lafayette frigate. So I'm very proud to be the commander of the Lafayette frigate. So I also invite my relative, my friend, to visit my ship. So, uh, very, well, after the Apache incident, I feel I'm lucky because I, I'm not a captain right now, or otherwise I would be accused of that sort of, kind of, sort of thing. So, I mean, the, the military, they should be respected. They should be, let them feel they are exceptional. Right. They are different with the others. So I'm very proud of my job. I, I, want to, I want to show off. But is it because I'm proud of myself? I'm proud of being a military. That's but good. on the other hand, some people will humiliate you, they're, they're, they're proud. So that, that caught a, a great, you know, that, that really suffered the military heart. Well, let me ask you this question. Okay, I'm going to throw you a curveball question here, but we only have like a minute or a minute and a half left. Maybe it's a little unfair to throw this question at you right at the end. If you could design an arms package of U.S. arms to be sold to Taiwan, what would be in that package? Uh, I don't know, actually, because I'm not in the in the activity. I'm not involved with the, with the program, but uh, a lot of package. Uh, that was delivered from the United States, probably not re not requested by Taiwan, or maybe Taiwan have been requested for years, and suddenly the United States would give it a package. Uh, for example, that um, in 2000, 2001, the EP3 incident, right. and only after that incident, only in a week, the uh, George W. Bush wanted to sell four KitKat destroyers to Taiwan. Right. And a week later, another week later, they're going to sell the Patriot, the Patriot a missile and a submarine and a P-3 aircraft. So that packet is suddenly to uh, like to give Taiwan, but the Taiwan is not well prepared. But that that was because EP-3 incident and uh, President Joe W. Bush they want to show his tough attitude toward China. Right. So when yeah, so Taiwan really uh, we had really sent a lot of requests for our equipment, but we don't know when the U.S. was going to approve it. And an EP3 incident caught a, a sudden, a, a gift from the sky just falls to our hand that we have so <laughs> big package of, of weapon, but we don't have that much money to have. So, so that caught a, a very a, a struggle during uh, 2002 to 2005 about the special budget issue. Right, 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 right. Uh, well, I, I think we're just about out of time here, um, but I want to thank you very much for joining us today. I think we had a great conversation. You, you mentioned some things that uh, I think a lot of our listeners and others probably haven't thought about before, this kind of polarizing um, dynamic within the military um, and how it impacts the will to fight, et cetera. So I really want to thank you very, very much for uh, joining me today. It's great to see you again. Uh, and I want to thank our audience for joining us, and we'll see you again back here next week, same time, same place. My guest next week will be Carl Baker from Pacific Forum. Carl is a longtime Korea expert. In fact, he's in South Korea right now. He's coming back on Sunday. He'll be here on Monday. He's going to be loaded with uh, very fresh information. And of course, we all know what's going on in the Korean Peninsula is very tense. There is a meeting between the South Korean president and Kim Jong un. There's a meeting, at least alleged, um, uh, a hypothetical, at least, uh, meeting between uh, Kim and President Trump. So uh, we'll see you here next week.